Assalamu alaikum, it's Adiba Ishaq and I welcome you all to the th last lecture of 33rd AGM and conference. So ladies and gen gentlemen, this is the most prestigious lecture of the conference. So it is, it is dedicated to the na father of the nation, Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. The theme of the lecture is uh, quest for prosperity, culture and economy. Uh, we open up our 30 th 33rd AGM and conference with the, by uh, dedicating a lecture to Alama Iqbal and now we are going to close it by dedicating a lecture to Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. The chief guest and the chairperson for this uh, lecture is Dr. Nadimul Haq. Dr. Haq is former Deputy Chairman, Ministry of Planning, Development and Reforms. He is also ex-Vice Chancellor of Pakistan Institute of Development Economics. Dr. Haq has also served Government of Pakistan as an advisor to the Ministry of Commerce. He has undertaken research on a wide range of topics including corruption, international trade, macroeconomic policies, poverty, labor, manpower, fiscal and monetary policy, human resource development and privatization. So please come on the stage. The invited speaker for this lecture is uh, Dr. Asad Zaman, Vice Chancellor, Pite. Dr. Asad Zaman did, Dr. Asad Zaman did his PhD in economics from Stanford University, USA. He has vast experience of research and teaching in world-renowned universities, including University of Pennsylvania, Columbia University, John Hopkins University, and Belkent University. Welcome, sir. We have uh, Dr. Ashfaq Hassan Khan as discussant in this lecture. Dr. Ashfaq Hassan Khan, uh, Dr. Ashfaq Hassan Khan is Dean, School of Social Sciences and Humanities at National University of Science and Technology. He is also a member of Economic Advisory Council of the Government of Pakistan. Dr. Khan has been Special Secretary Finance, Director General, Debt Office and Economic Advisor to the Ministry of Finance for 11 years. In recognition of his outstanding contribution in the field of economics, he has been awarded with Sitara Imtiaz in 2005 and ECO Excellence Award by Economic Cooperation Organization in 2010. So please come on the stage. We also have Dr. Nuzat Ahmed as a discussant with us. Dr. Nuzat Ahmed, uh, Dr. Nuzat Ahmed has undertaken research and development work for international agencies including World Bank, Asian Development Bank, UN agencies, USAID, Interagency, uh, inter Gender and Development Group, DFID, Overseas Development Institute, Harvard International Institute of Development, and the Aga Khan Foundation. She has very diverse work experience in development sector of various countries. Ma'am, please come on the stage. <laughs> now I would request Dr. Nadim to please start the session. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Welcome to the Kajal lecture, which is really the height for the people's conference. It is the most important lecture, and I am very happy to welcome Asad Zaman. Asad Zaman is already being introduced, and uh, we all know him. Also, I have always had a very good conversation with him on the interaction with the world. He's always been ahead of the field. He started doing game theory much before that. He started doing many of the things. Analytics much before that. In fact, I remember, I still have a book on analytics, which is, I think, I'm sure this about, but I still have it. Um, and he was also started approaching complexity before the rest of us. So I am deeply honored to have Asad Zaman here for this lecture. I'm sure we'll provoke discussion. We are looking through it. It's very interesting, very well done. So, so sir, please take the stage. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. So, you see, um, intellectual activity is an act of imagination. 
It's like, you know, Harry Potter and stuff. You have to let go of what you believe and start to acquire a different way of looking at the world. And you cannot do that if you hang on to your own preconceptions. And it doesn't have to be true or false. This is a misconception. There are many different ways of looking at the world and one acquires perspective by simply um, uh, being a neutral bystander. This is what it means to be pluralism. So after you acquire a variety of different perspectives, then only you can piece together and get a three-dimensional view. So this time I'm going to present a very different perspective on the world and on economic theory from one that you are accustomed to. So that's why I was preparing you. So the first question to ask is why are we here? I mean, what is the purpose of my life? Now, unfortunately, throughout the course of this, uh, your education, you have never encountered this question. And yet, how can we decide what I should do, what I should not do, what kind of economic policy there should be, social systems, everything, if we don't even know the purpose of life? As uh, uh, the Cheshire cat said to Alice, Alice asked her, which way should I go? So she said, well, where do you want to get to? So she said, well, I, it doesn't matter. So she said, that it doesn't matter which path you choose. All paths are equivalent if you have no purpose. So social science, all of it depends on the answer to the question of what is the purpose of my life. Now, why did we not, I mean, we have all been studying social science for years and years, and yet we haven't focused on this question. Why? Because there is a, a predetermined answer. The answer has been given, and the answer is that there is no purpose. So, famous Burton Russell quote that, whatever we do, however well we do it, nobody is looking, nobody cares. Everything will end when the universe ends. Life was created by an accident, and it will end by an accident. So life is meaningless. There is no purpose. So once this answer is decided upon, then uh, one doesn't discuss it anymore. But this lack of meaning affects everything that we do. I mean, this is also one answer. It is not that this is the answer. There are many answers. If we take this particular answer, it will lead us to certain ways of thinking at, about the world and looking at the world. So now, Actually, this is a new answer the world never had. I mean, throughout history, human beings have had purpose and have had fantastic battles, uh, both uh, physical and intellectual, about this question of purpose. It is only in this very, very brief modern era that this idea that life could be without purpose emerged. It's part of the existentialist philosophy. It's very, very recent. So, how did this happen? Well, there is this process called the Great Transformation which took place in Europe in which uh, a traditional society was converted to a market society by the processes of industrialization and by many other forces which worked simultaneously and are too complicated to discuss at this time. But basically, in traditional society, Society was an organic whole. We, work, we all worked together for a common purpose. There was the idea of a community and a society, uh, the values of being self-sufficient, being responsible for each other, and um, having a limited um, right to property. That is, my right to property was constrained by uh, allowing other people's to use it. It was more on the line of an amana, a trust, rather than an absolute right. That was the traditional society. When the transition took place, and this transition was not um, gradual or evolutionary, it was rather uh, by a battle and by destroying traditional values that the modern market society came into existence, in which the society is not, no longer an uh, organic whole. It consists of different groups fighting each other for power with no particular common values or purpose. Uh, everyone is an individual free to act for himself 
everyone has his own vision and they need not have anything in common. As Thatcher said, expressing this idea, there is no society, it is just a collection of individuals. We all depend on the informal market for our needs, which doesn't exist as an entity, whereas in a traditional society, we depend on each other. Uh, and everybody has an absolute right to his property. So these are some of the features of the market society that came into existence as a result of the Great Transformation. Now, after the Great Transformation, and, uh, Europeans have conducted an, uh, an amazing experiment. The first one in human history uh, was done in the 20th century. This idea that pursuit of wealth is a good thing, this was, nobody ever believed it in all cultures, Chinese, Indians, uh, Africans, take any culture and everybody universally thinks that pursuit of wealth as an end in itself is a harmful thing. Now, Keynes is a key to understanding what happened. Uh, he has a long quote from which I have an excerpt here, that the love of money is a disgusting morbidity. This was not his individual quirk, but that was widely believed. Nonetheless, this is very important, even though it is disgusting, it is a psychotic kind of a thing, we must cultivate it. This is the European experiment. Why? Because if everybody starts pursuing wealth, then wealth will accumulate, and that is the way that we will achieve heavens on earth. We will turn this earth into a paradise because there is nothing to hope for in the, in the uh, hereafter, of course. That's one of the elements. So this idea that let the people just gather the wealth and eventually everybody will benefit, this trickle-down idea is at the heart of Western economic thought. It cannot be removed from it. So now, one of the things to understand is that this great transformation uh, the values of a market society are antithetical. It cannot be done in a, a gradual evolutionary mode. They, they are enemies of each other. One cannot coexist with the other. So the great transformation did not take place by a, in a step-by-step -step manner. It took place by a revolution. The, ruth, the value, traditional values were ruthlessly crushed. Um, so just to understand very briefly this uh, topic which can be uh, discussed at length and has been an established by experiments, etc., that we have two sets of values within ourselves. One is a traditional uh, social value and one is a market value and these two are antithetical to each other, they are opposed to each other. Just to understand it in a, just a, one sentence, suppose that my mother make, cooks a very good meal for me and I say, oh, Mother, this is a great meal. How much would, should I pay you for this? So uh, how ridiculous it sounds. This is just illustrates the conflict between market norms and social norms. So in the process of the great transformation, there was a vision of society that was lost. The idea that society is an organic whole, we can work together for common goals. This was dropped and instead, a new vision of a secular society in which there are different groups with no commonalities. So the only thing that binds us together is that we agree to abide by a common set of laws. That is the rule of law which was, which and the laws are arbitrary. Nobody actually believes that these laws are sacred anymore because uh, what is sacred to me is not sacred to you and vice versa in a secular society. So there is no, so nonetheless, these laws have to be treated as sacred because if there is nothing sacred, then anything goes. So one art artificially creates a human-made set of laws known to be deficient and then one respects them as if they were the word of God because this is the only way a secular society can, be, can work. So now what have been the consequences of this pursuit of wealth, this mad uh, rush to uh, create heavens on earth by accumulating gold and silver without any purpose. Well, um, wealth has indeed accumulated at a tremendous rate. That's called the hockey stick argument that uh, a hockey stick is flat for a long time and then it just jumps up 
So you, if you look at the wealth, it has indeed worked exactly as the people who uh, set off this experiment had hoped. But uh, the consequences have been disastrous on many other fronts. Actually, you can say that this wealth is not being created out of nowhere. It is created by destroying natural wealth of many times. And what you destroy is a lot more than what you get. If you have a, 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 a rainforest and you think of it as timber for furniture, well, certainly you get money for furniture, but the value of what you created is something that took millions of years to create and uh, trillions of dollars would not be able to recreate it. So uh, it's just like the oil, we can count it as a, uh, as a cost, uh, as a profit, but what, we, what is being destroyed is something which can never be recreated. So if you look at the, the wealth angle, then it seems like a great thing was happened. But if you look at all other dimensions of human existence, you see a tremendous amount of damage, a reverse hockey stick, in fact. So this is the capitalist picture, uh, which shows the tremendous increase in wealth per capita, that wealth is flat up till the 19th century and then it suddenly shoots up. This is actually painting a, a, a tremendously failed experiment as a tremendously successful experiment. But if you look at the other side, uh, the costs of it, then they, uh, this is the number of species which have been destroyed. So we are on living in a new era geographically because so many animals, so many kinds of species have been destroyed that these used to happen in millions of years, which is happening in a century or two. And this is just one angle. If you look at climate, if you look at uh, pollution of the ocean, the environment, I mean, things seem like uh, the environmental scientists are saying that uh, humanity might go out of existence in 2050. The environment might be so inhospitable. So um, the question that I would like to pose is, can we reverse the great transformation? The idea, the great transformation says that everybody is in it for himself. There is no society. I am all alone and you are all alone. So in this lonely and hostile world where you're trying to cut my throat if I'm not looking and I'm trying to cut yours, can we move to a more civilized world? And so this involves reversing the great transformation. How can we do that? Uh, this involves creating a collective vision for mankind as a whole. This concept of nation has, been, has proven to be deadly. The greatest wars in the history of mankind were done by nations and this idea that I should die for my nations and I should make you die for yours, this hasn't turned out to be a very healthy idea for uh, mankind as a whole. So it's no, it's no longer a good idea to be crafting vision for Pakistan. We should be thinking higher. And so uh, this is not something that is new to history. but Actually, Marshall Hodgson writes about the venture of Islam that Muslims succeeded in building a new form of society and over centuries this society spread throughout the most of the world, uniting all mankind under its ideals, which are the best that are available to mankind as a whole. So uh, the idea that uh, um, we want to unite mankind on the welfare of mankind. Uh, this is a di very different idea from the capitalist idea which leads to accumulation of wealth in the hands of eight people. So what we would like to start out with some uh, basic uh, premises for creating a new vision along which we can try to unite mankind. These are visions that are built into the heart of every human being. So one of the elements of this, the first element, as, as every human being has infinite potential. Nobody, and Quran expresses it like this, that if you take one life, it is as if you have killed the entire planet. And if you save one life, it is as if you have saved the entire humanity. 
So this is telling us about how precious every single human life is. So we start with this as an axiom which we believe that all human beings can buy into and this is a collective vision. Uh, so then I cannot kill somebody because he is a Hindu or a Jew. The all human beings are infinitely precious. So now it is uh, our collective responsibility as, as uh, together we must ensure that every child who is born receives the opportunity to develop the capabilities that are planted inside him or her. And so let us redefine prosperity from accumulating wealth to saying that a society is prosperous if every child, every human being has the opportunity to develop his potential, to develop his capabilities and to develop his character. Now once we take this as our goal, then there is no scarcity. If we are all care for each other, if we are all brothers and sisters, then there is no scarcity because if you lack something, I will give it to you. And if I need something, I have a thousand brothers I can ask from. I am rich even if I don't have anything in my pocket. So this kind of uh, social capital, you might call it, is the essence of humanity. So how can we launch this revolution? So uh, first we have to, yani, just uh, like reversing the great transformation, economists teach us that Y is equal to F of KL, that human beings are an input to the production of material objects, wealth. So this is actually a cruel inversion of priorities. Uh, human beings are not an input into anything. Wealth is an input to the uh, production of welfare for human beings. And so all the material that we have been given is a means to empower and enable man to develop their capabilities. And so this is what we need to look at. We, we don't want to count how much money is, has been created. We want to count how, this, how money is being used to enrich people's lives. This is not being done. So many people actually Mahbub al Haq's revolutionary insight was that human beings are the means and the ends of development. So if you want to create wealth actually uh, if you empower human beings they will create wealth but maybe that wealth will not be of a form which is marketable. Maybe it will be art, maybe it will be literature, maybe it will be uh, spiritual achievements which cannot be counted or, uh, or quantified. So uh, these are not things which can be counted in dollars. Unfortunately this idea, the market society generates the idea that everything is for sale. But uh, the traditional society considers that the most important things in life like love, happiness, compassion, generosity, these are not for sale. And uh, though market society generates cynicism, people think that no everything is for sale. But actually if you ask for blood donors to volunteer uh, to give to people who are needy, people will gladly volunteer. But if you ask that I will pay you 5000 rupees for a pint of blood, very few people will volunteer. So this idea that human beings are connected on a heart to heart basis, this is actually the truth about human beings, even though we have been taught to believe otherwise. So what are the consequences of redefining prosperity in this way? This is not an abstract airy-fairy kind of thing. This has very down-to-earth concrete practical implications. So economics seeks to acquire more wealth for everybody, GNP per capita, everybody should have more. We say no, we want to have more health for everybody. So suppose that an income transfer can improve the health, education, uh, life expectancy, capability of others, of some, without harming others, exactly on the lines of Pareto. Then we will say that this is a, a welfare improving proposition. And now, if you think of the eight people who have more than three and a half billion, do you think that their health, education or welfare is improved by all that money? No. That excess money only gives them power to manipulate the lives of others and it is not good for them. So, 
actually uh, taxing them and providing wealth to th those who need it is, is, would be an essential aspect of this uh, uh, vision. So actually if we follow this vision then we would not want to press for growth. We would want to say that you see uh, people who have studied the issue say that these rising standards of living are harmful, are uh, produce a positive externality because people get used to any standard of living. In Islam, we are all responsible collectively. If there is any child in Pakistan who is hungry, then it's my job to make sure that he has food, clothing, housing. So Muslim societies through for a thousand uh, years accomplished through this through the institution of waqf. Uh, people who had excess money built waqaf and they, these waqaf we used to uh, feed the hungry, take care of widows, orphans, take, do a huge, a vast range, thousands of social functions were performed. Because the vision of the society is that any wealth that is over my needs, excess, belongs to others who need it. The vision was not that if I have more, I should get even more, which is the capitalist uh, vision. So what are the obstacles to launching this revolution? Well, modern society came into being by ruthlessly crushing traditional society. It was not a peaceful coexistence. And so, to the extent that we are living in a market society, we have been conditioned to think in ways that are very uh, uh, anti-social. We have been trained to look out for number one. We have been trained that uh, you know, every day we see these um, ads about how a man is enjoying life without regards for others. We are, we are trained to think that if you have a meal for 10,000 rupees in Serena and the waiter who is serving you, his child doesn't have uh, the medicine to buy uh, to, to save his life, that's fine. You, you, you are not responsible for him. But the fact is that uh, this is not um, this is not how human beings are human beings are built to be generous empirical findings from psychology show that human be beings derive more happiness from helping others than they do by stuffing their stomachs which is what economics teaches you so um, it's not possible to make gradual changes, that is, we make uh, small patchwork changes on a market society to get back to a traditional society. Just like the market society came into existence by a war, so a traditional society can only be uh, bought back, the reversal can only be done by a war. But this war is not a physical war, it is not fought with guns and tanks, it is an ideological war. The central battle that we need to fight is a war of ideas. So in this battle of ideas, a most powerful tool of the poor and the rich, uh, poor and the power, uh, most powerful tool of the rich and the wealthy and the powerful has been what I will call ET1%. ET1% is what is ordinarily called economic theory, which is taught in colleges and universities and which we all learned if we were in economics. This ET1% is not as it claims to be a positive theory about the real world. It is just a piece of propaganda which is designed to strengthen these and justify the privileges that the rich enjoy. So this ideology which we have been taught to believe is a positive theory has to be replaced. This is the major battle that has to be fought by an ET 90%, an economic theory which looks out for the interests of the bottom 90%. So what is ET 1%? Let me explain further. Marx said that capitalism works not by the force of the capitalists, not by because they have uh, the guns and the sticks. It works because the capitalists persuade the laborers that his exploitation is necessary and just and this is exactly like this, 81% persuades the bottom 90% that our being hungry and our starving 
an hour being exploited is necessary for the system to work. So 81% works by persuading the masses that modern capitalism worked by natural economic laws. There are economic laws which we cannot resist. If the economic law says that somebody is hungry, then there's nothing you can do. Uh, these laws cannot be opposed. Furthermore, it argues that this uh, economic law produces just and fair outcomes. Everybody gets the marginal product. So people get what they pro produce, what they deserve. Furthermore, 81% uh, says that this is an efficient distribution. It, uh, this system is best for everyone. It cre creates wealth, it creates uh, wonderful outcomes and everybody benefits. So it has three normative strong propositions which are used to brainwash the masses into believing that this system is best for everyone's interests. So just to illustrate what I am saying that economic theory is actually the soft power of the 1%, I will show you this picture of the income distribution. See class A, this is the share of the top 10 percent. So if you look up to 1940, you see that the top 10 percent are riding high. Uh, that's because classical economic theory is exactly as I said 81 uh, percent. By benefiting from that theory, they uh, enjoy wealth and now 1940 is the break caused by World War uh, two. After that war, Keynesian economics came into existence as a consequence of the Great Depression. Keynesian economics is not actually 80-90% as I would call it, but it is still, it says one thing only, it's, it's highly capitalist in fact, but it says one thing which is in favor of the bottom 90% and that thing is that uh, Keynes said that uh, market does not eliminate unemployment. So we, we the government should look out after the laborer, the, the interests of the unemployed. So this one piece of theory uh, was enough to change the balance and if you look at the share of the bottom uh, uh, top 10 percent, it falls quite a bit in the period between 1940 and 1980. So this 40 years was a golden era of prosperity in Europe. Piketty also picks this up that there was this one period in which uh, capitalism didn't work as expected and that's because capitalist theory was broken for a while. But while this was going on, the uh, capitalists were working very hard in the background to patch up their theories and, they, uh, and, and to attempt a new takeover which happened in 1980s with the Reagan Thatcher revolution and the ascent of the Chicago school. And as soon as the Chicago school deregulation, liberalization, privatization came into being, you see that the uh, fortunes of the 1% skyrocketed and, uh, and they continue to do so because the theory continues to dominate. Even after the uh, global financial crisis, there has been no change in the theories that are being taught at the leading universities. So 81 percent we can call the weapons of mass deception because they use uh, ideas which are simply not true and they deceive people into believing them. So the uh, 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 one of the key ideas is that scarcity is the cause of you know misery. We know that billions are hungry. Why are they hungry? Well because there's not enough food. This is just a lie. If we grow more food, we already there is enough food in the world to feed the hungry. So they, they tell you to look in directions different from the ones that needs to be looked at. This GNP per capita, this is also a lie. A quantity theory of many solo, I'll, I'll go into these in a little bit greater detail. So is scarcity the fundamental problem that economists keep telling us? Such a huge lie, a monstrous lie. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs in uh, End of Poverty says that it will take about 175 billion dollars a year to end, uh, yani to take care of all basic needs of everybody on the planet. Now how much is 175 billion? Well, he calculated that it's 0.7% of the GDP of 30 OECD countries. So if they just 
uh, put this aside, that will be enough to end poverty. So there is no scarcity. Uh, 175 billion is about 15 percent of the 1.2 trillion million military expense being done on the world. So if we just stop fighting each other, we can end the poverty. No scarcity. Uh, Health care costs of obesity are estimated at 210 million dollar, billion dollars. So if we just stop eating too much, maximizing our consumption, we can end poverty. The global cosmetics industry is 445 billion dollars. So ladies, if we stop beautifying ourselves by one, 33 <laughs> percent. <laughs> so where is the scarcity? Where is the scarcity? Now, what Easterlin said is that if we chase growth, uh, we have been chasing growth successfully. We have doubled and uh, tripled and quintupled and our standards of living are 10 times what they were a century ago. So has all this growth uh, eliminated scarcity? No, scarcity has become even larger. They took a survey of 200 millionaires and asked at least, and they were very unhappy on all dimensions, but they said at least one thing, you have enough money. Said so, no, no, we don't have enough money. We need at least another few million to, to achieve financial stability. So uh, pursuit of growth is, not, is just an illusion. Allah Ta'ala says that yani, this mataul gurur, it's, it's uh, in, uh, pursuit of an illusion. So what is the solution to the problem of scarcity? The problem is, uh, the solution is empathy. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and said that, how can I eat refined bread when uh, there are other people who are hungry who cannot get this? So if in my heart I have the feeling that if there is somebody hungry, I have compassion for him. This is the idea that, that will get rid of the scarcity, not accumulation of wealth. So another 81% uh, weapon of mass deception is the GNP per capita. Now this is a weapon of mass deception. We are, everybody is pursuing it. We all look at this number, but actually what is GNP per capita? It says, uh, the wealthy people say, don't look at the amount of wealth in our hands. First, what you do in calculating GNP per capita is imagine that this wealth is distributed equally to everybody. So this, this, this illusion, you take this money and you give it equally to everybody. That is, you divide by the population. And then you say, this is the GNP per capita. What, yani, this is a great uh, subterfuge. Uh, now you look at the GNP, suppose we, we, we measure, look at the wealth before we distribute to everybody. Then that's the picture. The bottom 20%, their income hasn't changed at all. Uh, the second 20%, their income is also flat. What has happened at the top 20% uh, top and uh, ha they have been gaining. So the rich have been gaining, but of course no one notices but because when you take GNP per capita, this this th picture is, uh, dis disappears. So the idea that the quantity theory of money is a veil, every student repeats very uh, wisely, profoundly that, you know, money is a veil. They don't understand that they have been deceived. This idea that money is a veil, it's itself a veil. It uh, prevents you from looking at how money functions and how it goes to the pockets of the wealthy, how it is taken out of the pockets of the poor. Money is all important. It's the lifeblood of the economy. If you don't study money, you will never find out how the rich get rich. 81%, you know, in the olden times, they used to have land in the production function. Function as capital, labor, and land. But then uh, Henry George came along and said, you know, these lands and uh, uh, rentiers, they earn money without doing any work. So they exploit. So then in a counter maneuver, they merge the land with the capital so you wouldn't see it. So now there's no land in the... Similarly, uh, the idea that uh, the production function, the marginal productivity theory, this was born to, this was built to counter Marx. Marx said that the capitalists exploit labor. So the marginal productivity theory says, no, the capitalist earns what he deserves uh, and the laborer earns what he deserves. Now, um, 
this this idea you can contest on theoretical grounds. Um, Joan Robinson did. There is no such thing as capital actually. But leave that aside. Basically, uh, the issue is that the consequence of this is that the rich, because they, uh, they, they, they are the most productive members of society. This is actually widely briefed and, and trumpeted by Trump, who has used it to uh, enact the tax cuts, which, will, which are the greatest uh, boon for the already wealthy. And why? Because the wealthy are the greatest uh, producers of wealth, so they deserve these breaks. The poor are hungry, they will just eat. So how can we launch a revolution? Well, there's the Marxist solution. We should unite the laborers and uh, fight uh, against the chains uh, of capitalists. Uh, this uh, does not seem to work very well for two reasons. One is that, all right, maybe we can successfully organize a revolution, but eventually, uh, when it comes to ruling, only a few people will be in power. And even if they come from the bottom classes, they will um, end up acting just like the uh, top 1%. So uh, this solution somehow doesn't work. So the Islamic solution is rather different. It says that let us create a culture of generosity, create kindness, compassion, teach the rich to feel, uh, yani instead of destroying the rich, uh, understand that the rich are also human beings. They were also born of mothers. They have hearts. Appeal and yani create uh, good instincts to them. This is how traditional societies used to work. Encourage the use of wealth to eradicate poverty. This is what the Quran says. Stay, uh, let those who have excess wealth give to the poor. Discourage excessive accumulation of wealth. Persuade mil millionaires that, you know, accumulating wealth is an illusion. It will not buy you happiness. This is actually true. The richest people in the world, surveys show, are un the unhappiest. Tell them you spend. You see, this is what, if you read Dickens, A Christmas Carol, this is what the man learns, he, uh, the miser, that he gives money to the uh, poor, his poor worker, and he feels much happier than he did with, with that. So, teaching them how to be. Good people, teaching everyone how to be a good person. How did Islam create this revolution? Now, you see, this is the greatest thing. Yani, yes, we yesterday we heard about the, uh, the stages of Rostow's stage of growth. People have studied how, over the course of 300 years, Britain developed and divided into stages and uh, asked that we should also follow this trajectory and 300 years later, we will also be rich like Britain. Well, that's pretty unlikely. But what about the, the greatest revolution in human history took place when the Prophet ﷺ came to the ignorant and backward Arab and within 30 years they were leaders of the world and they created a civilization the likes of which lasted for a thousand years and which was a very civilized and gentle and caring and responsible. Uh, it uh, had the... At, at its heart, the model was excellence and conduct, good ikhlaq. Prophet ﷺ was mercy to all mankind. The mercy is at the heart of this. All men and women are brothers and sisters. Born of Adam and Hawa, we are all equal and we are responsible for each other. Power, these are revolutionary ideas. Power is not given so that you can exploit others. It is given to, for you to help the oppressed and weak and prevent them from being exploited and oppressed. Wealth is not given for you to extract, it is given for you to help others in need. The leader of the nation is the servant of the people. These are all revolutionary ideas that, that change the world. All of the creation of God is the family of God. The one who serves uh, the people is performing the highest form of worship. So the formula for success today is the same as it was 1400 years ago, but people are, uh, people are searching in the wrong direction. That's where I will end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you very much. I think it's a very timely lecture. The whole world is searching for a new solution after the 2008 crisis and after so many 
uh, after the Piketty inequality and after so many other um, interventions that we see, especially artificial intelligence, etc. So yes, you're right, the search for a new value system is on. And I think you've done a tour de force of history. Uh, lots of interesting thoughts there. Um, two or three solutions. So I think I'll take the discussions up to the challenge and see what Ashfaq Saab has to say and respond. Ashfaq Hassan Khan, everybody knows. I don't have to introduce him. He's on television almost every day. And I think Ashfaq Saab has one singular credit to his, uh, to his credit, which is that Dar Saab called him a pseudo-economist. So Ashfaq Saab, go ahead. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I am a pseudo-economist, <clears throat> according to Dar Saab. So he is on the bed. I am standing here. <laughs> so thank you very much. I am grateful to Pai for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on the subject. But interesting part is that I received this paper this uh, two hours ago, about three hours ago. So, but I knew what is going to come. <laughs> there are, I think this, this topic and the chair and the discussions are prepared in such a way that you have heard the Chicago school. Chicago is sharing, <laughs> right? So I was asking. And we would like to hear also from the Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> so I was asking Nadeem. So Nadeem was saying that now I have been converted to Islam. <laughs> <laughs> and he asked me, he asked me to ask Nuzhat ke wo dupatta bhi old hai. Jo mein abhi tak kanwe nahi kiya. You see, there are two types of economists. One who think and break new path. And there are others who travels on the discovered path. Dr. Asad Zaman, who is my teacher, he was my teacher at the University of Pennsylvania. He has decided to choose the path where you think, you discover, you break new path, and you give or define the path. And I am the one who travels. I'm nervous. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm a risk averse. So I try to travel on the discovered path. So I'm, I belong to the second category. Secondly, <clears throat> I have spent substantial amount of my career in dealing with real life economics. From academics to real life economics, where I really found that sometimes economic theory doesn't work. Therefore, I'm not the one who is going to travel on roads which have not been taken before. I am the one who loves to travel on a discovered path, safe, game khelna hai. So, <clears throat> I consider this topic, I consider this topic, quest for prosperity, market and development in a different manner, in a manner of real life, as I have seen during my stay in PID and in the Ministry of Finance, and now at the university. I consider these three are linked with each other. Market, 
development and prosperity are linked with each other. And the chain of causation runs from market to development to prosperity. When I say market, market means efficient market. The question is how to make market efficient. That leads to the idea of reforms. Reform is the only constant in life is reforms, change. So you keep on changing, learning and addressing the issues, removing irritants and move forward. Therefore, key to prosperity or the road to prosperity passes through reforms and efficient market. Now the idea is that what kind of reforms and how we can make these reforms efficient. We know that investment is key determinant of economic growth. What should we do to reform so that we attract more investment, more growth, more prosperity? This is the road taken before. Mm -hmm. I'm not moving to the roads which is still undefined, but people are working on that. We have learned that sound macroeconomic policies is essential for promoting investment because it creates a positive macroeconomic environment which will attract investment. But such policies needs to be supplemented and complemented by reforms. In other words, sound macroeconomic policies is not enough. What kind of reforms? I consider three types of reforms. Oh, sorry, three types. One is sound macroeconomic policies, low deficit, low budget, uh, current account deficit, low inflation, sufficient amount of foreign exchange reserve. This is one idea. The other is governance reform, and the third one is infrastructure. When I say governance, bureaucratic hurdles, raste mein rukavte khade karte hain, our labor, cumbersome labor laws will discourage people to undertake new investment. Simplification of rules and regulation, rule of law, transparency, less corruption, accessibility of legal system. These are all reforms. reforms Is anybody doing it in our society and government? I don't, I don't know. Then we need infrastructure. Uninterrupted, affordable powers, Good condition of roads, rail, telecommunication, yes, sari hain. All these things constitute a good macroeconomic environment which will promote growth, will lead to prosperity. Yeah. Hai. They can reforms rest on liberalization, deregulation, and privatization. But this does not mean the abdication of responsibilities of the government. Therefore, we need an honest referee in the shape of regulatory bodies who takes care of the interest of common man and the government. So reg regulatory bodies are also essential. But all these things will not lead to the prosperity of the people, those are who are in the, uh, at the bottom. As pointed out in Dr. Asadaman lecture, what will happen to the poor? who cannot sustain or participate in this type of reforms in economic activity, poor, and uh, 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 people living below the poverty line. Therefore, it is the responsibility of the state to spend on human capital. This will ensure the participation of the poor. If you provide them a skill, provide them education, they will be able to participate in the economic activities and gain from this prosperity. Health, social protection, 
skill development. These are the responsibilities of the government. Those who cannot afford to go to universities must be given this opportunities. So the whole idea is to provide opportunities, build the capabilities of the poor so that they can equally participate in the process of development. That will lead to prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Now I think you have Dr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, if the task wasn't uh, hard enough, I'm the last speaker. Uh, is it? Oh, all right. I'm not the second last anyway. Um, first, let me start by saying a very thank you to PIDE, PhD, and to Doc Saab, Dr. Asad Zaman Saab. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure to be here. And I've been taken care of. I get respect and love, and I thank you all for that. Um, it is very difficult to comment on uh, Asad Saab's paper. Uh, and today's paper is even more difficult to comment on. But let me just address the two questions that were raised in, in, in a sort of about the dupatta, <laughs> OK? Um, it's how I look is more important than what do I do. And that is the problem, OK? And secondly, uh, please go and research of how much cosmetics are being <coughs> spent on men. Some <laughs> There's a whole industry out there now, you know? So don't blame us. <laughs> Keep doing whatever you're doing. <laughs> okay, so a uh, very convincing and very elaborate uh, paper. And uh, nobody can argue with the, against the fundamentals of the presentation. And we see the world, and as Nadeem Saab has said, we need a new order, we need a new, uh, new way of thinking. So, uh, but no doubt Islam provides a complete and comprehensive set of guidelines for building such a society. There is no doubt about that. But let's take a moment and look at what is happening around us. We see, let's look at Pakistan, very close to where we are. Injustice, wealth is power, rich are getting away with murder, poor are imprisoned for petty thefts. We put our children in jails and forget about them. Poverty, hunger, extravagance, waste. I was uh, a few years back, I was flying from Karachi to Islamabad. And I, I had a gentleman sitting next to me. And we started discussing. I was very naive at that time. So we were talking about who was running Pakistan and what was happening. There must be somebody looking after us. Maybe Allah is looking after us, so Pakistan is running fine. Then we started talking and he said, you know, I asked him and he seemed, he, later I found out that he was the founder of the reform school in Pakistan. She said, you know, I think that the uh, philanthropy in mm -hmm. Pakistan is the reason why Pakistan is still running and that that is one of the reasons why Pakistan has not reached a revolution in spite of all its difficulties. And we are still in a bit of difficulty now. So um, maybe we now see a breakdown in this waqf, the, the state's responsibility to provide and we, the, the, for everyone and chariti, charity. So we need to look at that. Uh, so in such an environment, it becomes very difficult to convince people not to pursue wealth by whatever means are at their disposal, because that means power, and, and it is very close to us. I often talk to my students. Uh, we discuss all of this. And uh, it is difficult to comment, especially so uh, in the environment today, uh, to speak uh, or comment on the religion because it is taken, we see it on television all the time, we see it around us, so we become very cautious. And even if we want to comment on something, we don't. But we can, 
we discuss in the privacy of our offices and in, in uh, with with our students and they say that um, you know in in pakistan let me inspired by that urdu mein kar lete hain hum bachon ko sikhate hain to read the quran in arabic theek hai they do not understand it they do not know what it means hum ye bhi batate hain ki agar aap ye surat itni martaba padhe to aapko itna sawab hoga theek hai hum padhte bhi hain lekin agar samajh ke padhe to wo phir aur bhi sawab hoga log padhe likhe nahi hain wo apne taur pe knowledge hasil nahi kar sakte so misunderstanding ek tarah ki ho jati hai people don't understand what they are reading ye bacche kehte hain students mere aur naujawan jo log hain wo is pe comment karte hain टीचिंग ऑफ इस्लाम जो है वो अक्सर नॉट इंटरेस्टेड टू द बेस्ट ऑफ मुस्लिम्स ठीक है आप इमामत को देख लें टू मिनट्स ओके और राइट और राइट दैट्स नॉट फेयर आई डू आई गेट टू मिनट्स मोर ऑन जेंडर ओके सो आई गेट फोर मिनट्स राइट थैंक यू ओके सो दे से ओके Who 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 are our role models? पहन लूँगी. Four minutes. If you give me another minute, I'll. तो वो कहते हैं कि ये role model हैं. हम इस्लाम में हमें पढ़ाया जाता है. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the biggest role model. There are other role models, but you have to look close to you. When we look close to, how many practicing Muslims do we see around here? मैं लेट मी टेल यू आई वॉज डॉक्टर साहब फर्स्ट रिसर्च असिस्टेंट एट ए आर सी तो जब मैंने डॉक्टर साहब को देखा तो मैं बड़ी हैरान हो गई मैंने कहा पेंसिल्वेनिया से डॉक्टर साहब आए हैं यू नो एंड आई वॉज लाइक यंग एंड यू नो लुकिंग एट हम देखते थे एहसान रशीद को थ्री पीस सूट पहन के आते थे वो यू नो गर्मी में भी तो तो मैंने देखा लेकिन जब मैंने उनसे बातचीत की और ओवर द ईयर्स um i am uh, privileged to see that i see him as a true pr- practicing muslim he's kind you know you look so so how how many how many in in your lives how many people do you see like that uh, so or ye bhi dekha jata hai ki musliman ek dusre ko maar rahe hain lad rahe hain there is blood bloodshed in the name of islam so how do we convince people हमारी माशरे में क्या पुअर और वीमेन फील मार्जिनलाइज पीपल डू दे फील इक्वल डू द पावरफुल हेल्प अदर्स इज द लीडर ऑफ द नेशन सर्वेंट टू द पीपल हार्डली द सिविल सर्वेंट सर्वेंट्स टू द पीपल ऑफ कोर्स नॉट सो वाई इज द सिस्टम नॉट वर्किंग वी वर प्रॉस्परस इन इस्लाम दुनिया में फैला हुआ था तो क्या हुआ फिर उसकी डाउनफॉल का आप देखें उसको वापस लाने में क्या चीज़ें इम्पॉर्टेंट हैं क्या चीज़ें हैं क्यों हुआ क्यों वी वी वर रूलिंग द वर्ल्ड ठीक है ना तो हमारे किरदार से जाहिर है कुछ गड़बड़ है तो फिर ही ये सब हो रहा है एक और दो पॉइंट्स और लास्ट पॉइंट्स इस्लाम जो है सर इट्स बेस्ड ऑन फेथ दिस होल सिस्टम इज बेस्ड ऑन फेथ ठीक है जब हम विथ फेथ कम्स जेनरासिटी काइंडनेस कंपैशन सारी चीज़ें जो आपने हाईलाइट किए and of course the concept of welfare of entire human kind in our hearts so when we see all this around us our faith dwindles not the not on the basis not faith in principles of islam but faith in the practice of islam around us so the whole system is ki faith agar hogi to ye sab cheeze khud ba khud aa jayengi mere khayal se हज़रत उमर के पास इतनी दौलत थी उन्होंने सारी अपनी दौलत जो है वो उन्होंने लोगों में बांट दी रीडिस्ट्रीब्यूट कर दी फेथ उनको था कि दिस वॉज वॉट वॉट वॉज नीडिड एंड उनके लिए यही बेहतर था एंड वन अदर थिंग लास्ट थिंग इस्लाम वर्क ऑन अ बेसिस ऑफ वॉल्ट्री बेसिस राइट देर इज़ नो फोर्स ऑफ कि हम इम्प्लीमेंट करें फोर्स करके या किसी को फोर्स करें कि इस्लाम की तरफ रुझू हो या कुछ भी करें तो हाउ डू वी इंश्योर इन सच अ सिस्टम दैट हाउ डू वी इम्प्लीमेंट दैट राइट एंड द लास्ट थिंग इज दैट आई थिंक इस्लाम टीचेज अस टू बी टॉलरेंट एंड आई थिंक दैट गुड फॉर एवरीबडी वेदर दे आर मुस्लिम्स और नॉन मुस्लिम्स सो 
I'll stop here before they throw me out. <laughs> Thank you, Nuzat. Actually, time is a little bit less than 10 minutes. So, I think what we'll do is take three questions uh, very quickly. So, three questions, questions, no speeches or whatever. Okay. But where is the head? Let's mark them out. Who else? Any lady or something? One lady. TKG or con? Anybody from the back? Anybody from the back? Batayye. We'll choose Karen. Yo, Marzi, choose Karen. Chalaji, I think there's another lady there. Done. Achha, chalaji, you have to be char question. Chalaji, PT Sab. Parvez Tahir Sahib Ji, Parvez Tahir Sahib, Mike Tadeh Ji Me. Since it has come to storytelling, I will also tell a few stories. Okay? Hanji, sorry? Since it has come to telling stories, Haan. I will also tell a few stories. Okay. First of all, it seems that it was all in the family. An assistant, research assistant, a student, hmm. and of course, the Chicago connection. Hmm. Huh? Money sitting or money flying? Hmm? from the helicopter. Anyway, uh, first the comments by Ashwaka Sankhan. Get to the question, we've only got 10 minutes. Okay, one minute. Government college mein humare saath ek cricketer padhta tha. Un dinon sirf do economists mashur the, dono ka naam Rashid ka. Ishan Rashid ka inon ne naam liya, ek professor Rashid lao mein hote. Un ka test tha. To jab test ho gaya, तो हमने देखा वो क्रिकेटर जो है वो सबसे ज़्यादा खुश और हम सब डर रहे थे उससे पूछा तुमने ये सवाल किया उसने कहा नहीं तुमने ये किया कि नहीं तुमने ये किया और कुछ कीता की है जो मुझे आता था मैंने कर दिया डेट वाज अश्वार का संख्यान कमेंट नॉट कमेंटिंग ऑन द लेक्चर ओके केंस एंड द लेक्चर एक्सेप्� and uh, defunct economists. And I think, I must say, that you gave us the bare bones of defunct economists, OK? But then, we don't know where to go to. That is an important issue. You know, whatever you have said are values and I would suggest the universal value. It is our time khatam. So, the way forward, the chairman will give us the way forward. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I am from uh, Islamic University and uh, working at PIDE as well. I need to uh, ask some practical application for making the society responsible and similarly the individuals in the society to be responsible. Uh, uh, what uh, kind of uh, steps can be uh, taken, like uh, can we develop some ranking of cooperation index for countries or organizations? Or uh, uh, second point is that uh, when we talk about empowerment or uh, economic uh, independence, um, uh, is there any kind of empowerment about prosperity, trust, cooperation and uh, support from others' encouragement? Uh, shukriya, sir. Yasin Ayaz from Pied School of Public Policy. If you feel feeling hurt, then ask for the answer. The question is that Dr. Asad Zaman Sahib, who is the teacher's teacher, said that there are 45 billion cosmetic industries in the world where the world is worth. So, in Pakistan, there are a famous column of Ataul Haq Qasmi Sahib, who says that there are many friends of mine, who are in the face of 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 the face. تو بہت ساری حسینہ ایسی ہوتی ہیں جن کے چہروں کے اوپر ایسا نور جھلک رہا ہوتا ہے جیسا کہ اگلاف کعبہ کے اوپر تو اس کے اپر بھی کوئی کوش کمنٹ کریں پلیز ہاں جی کوئی کوئیسٹن نہیں جو جو وومن دیر جی کون تھی کھڑی ہو جائیں جی جو بھی تھی آپ وہ دیکھیں پیچھے دیکھیں جی وہاں پیچھے وہ 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 وہاں خط ہوں چلیں جی لاسٹ کوئیسٹن if anybody wants to ask quickly नहीं वहाँ से अब हो गया ना दे दिया किसी को कि नहीं डॉक्टर नवशा स्कूल आप इग्नोर्स कायदा से मिनिस्ट्री सर जो ना द द परसुएंस ऑफ वेल्थ इट सीम्स दैट यू नो व्हाट यू हैव हाइलाइटेड आप डज इट शो दैट यू नो दैट वी शुड नॉट परसू द वेल्थ इज इट इकाज यू नो इन द कन्वेंशनल इकोनॉमिक्स � so, 
Do you think that the pursuance of wealth is uh, negated? Hi, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, most of these questions are about the second phase. This, uh, my talk was only about persuading us to look at the world in a different way. Now the question of actually how to do it, what Islam is, actually that all of that requires reorienting the mind. For, uh, and one of the basic things is that Islam teaches us to look at the world as a process rather than an outcome. There are two main ways to think about and utility is outcome, that is what you eat. But there is also the process, how you, how you play the game instead of the result. So Islam is all about how you play the game. It doesn't matter whether you win or lose. So once you shift attention from outcome to process, then a lot of issues that were raised resolve. But it really requires a new way of thinking about the world and that would require um, a substantial amount of time. So I'll stop. Uh. Thank you, Ji. Thank you very much. I think Asad Sab, I'll just quickly uh, say, because Asad Sab had asked me to comment on this, I'll just quickly say a couple of things and then close the session. Since time is short, apparently the President of Pakistan is coming and far be it from me to be disrespectful to the President of Pakistan. So um, let me just say very quickly, Asad Sab, I think it's wonderful. I agree with you. Yes, of course, social science is at an impasse right now. There are so many things that we have to rethink. And I think it's a very important subject to talk about, and you've actually laid out the bare bones of it wonderfully. I think of it, I was thinking how to respond, and I think of it in two different ways. One is, um, I think you must have come across this book, Sapiens by, well, I'll, I'll step back a little, sorry. I think let's think of, uh, first thing, okay, let's take, take Sapiens. Sapiens is a book that describes the whole of human history in a single way. And the way it describes it is that, yes, purpose, says our purpose is to come together and our purpose is to look after each other, purpose to develop something. So our purpose has been storified in different ways. We have had different stories to make us do different things. And capitalism was what, but one story. There were other stories that happened. The purpose was exactly as Asad Zaman described, that there was a purpose. The purpose was to get a better life. It meant getting more money. It meant staving off hunger. So we did that. And I think a lot of this can be, um, what, a lot of what you said can be kind of fit in that framework. But related to this are also two or three other things that come out. I'm sure you've seen Deirdre McCloskey talk about bourgeois values. And I think a lot of what you're saying is, again, the search for values that you're searching, the same value that Deirdre McCloskey is looking for. Um, then I, would, I must quote also, my son wrote a very nice book a few years ago called Betterness, Omer Haq where he talks about how, as you talked about, that hey, there is a mismeasurement problem here. The way we are measuring GDP is wealth creation and that in itself, even if you don't turn to any religious values, that is mismeasuring the way we think, and then I think Stiglitz also wrote about it, that there is a mismeasurement that's at the heart of economics because it gives us a certain target and we go for it, and those who like data should look at that, and there is an alternative way to measure society. And my son was saying that, you know, we need to think of more transcendental measures of economics, regardless of Islam, and you go in there. I'll end by saying that there's another way of looking at it, which is through history. Again, we have to define what history is and how history works. And Hegel had that, and you remember the end of history by uh, Fukuyama. I think that that's how a different end of history is coming. And the different end of history is that we'll find out very soon that history has come to an end. But it won't be, the history won't, no, the history won't come to an end because as Hegel thought it was the death of ideology yeah. or as the climatologists think that we'll kill ourselves or the nuclear bomb or whatever. No, I'm sorry, history will end with a, himper, a whimper, not with a bang, how artificial intelligence will take care of us. So thank you very much. Folks, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, the, exactly. So I think, uh, we ended up exactly on time as my task was. So I shall surrender the floor to Ijaz Ghani. Thank you very much. Let me just quickly say three days of excellent work, PID. Uh, Sad Saab, through you, we'll thank the whole of PID. Please give a hand to PID and the staff for a great PSD. PSD is, a, PSD is a great institution. We must keep it alive. We must broaden it. Next time, I hope Sad Saab will persuade Lahore to come and you'll persuade Karachi to come. Thank you. Actually, we.
uh, for the past two years, we haven't been able to have, for various reasons, the annual general meeting. As somebody said, this is the conference, not the annual. So I am intending that, inshallah, in uh, two or three months, we will actually call a separate annual general meeting to talk about PSDE itself as an organization and how it can be. Uh, actually, it, it's a virtual organization right now. It doesn't exist except for the AGM. But I would like to make it into a real organization. So we will call people and we will organize. We'll think about how this AGM can be functional throughout the year. And thank you very much all for attending. And I think we can call this to a close. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your attention and patience. Uh, and thank you, all the panelists, for such a useful discussion. And uh, now I would request uh, the chairperson, Dr. Nadeem al Haq, to pr uh, please present the souvenirs to the panelists. So please come forward. First, Dr. Asad Zaman. <laughs> Dr. Ishfaq Hassan Khan, so please come forward. <laughs> Dr. Nuzat Ahmed. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And now I request Dr. Asad Zaman to please present a shield to Dr. Nadeem al Haq. Thank you, sir. And now I would hand over the session to Secretary PSDE, Dr. Ijaz Ghani, to formally close the, this AGM and conference. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Dr. Sajman, Vice Chancellor, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, and President, Pakistan Society of Development Economists. Uh, Dr. Nadeem ul Haq, former Deputy Chairman, Planning Commission. Uh, my respected teachers, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Pakistan Society of Development Economists. It is my pleasant duty to thank all the participants of the conference. I would like to thank our distinguished speakers, panelists, discussants, and presenters who have traveled from abroad and Pakistan to participate in the conference. I would also like to thank the members of the faculty and students who have traveled from the far-flung area of Pakistan to come, attend, and participate in the conference. The three days proceedings and deliberations of the conference has certainly provided a forum where policymakers, academics, and other stakeholders have discussed and debated various issues pertaining to Pakistan's economic development in the rapidly changing global economic environment. The research papers I think 48 papers, uh, have, 48 technical papers have been presented in 12 technical sessions, and the research papers on the various aspects of uh, uh, of the major theme and then the 10 sub themes have focused on critical dimensions of the economic development uh, of Pakistan. Um, they have discussed the uh, general perspectives as well as the specific issues related uh, to the. Uh, different scenarios. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, they have suggested the policy prescriptions for, for the policy makers and they have uh, given uh, uh, their recommendations and suggestions for the way forward of the future progress. Um, I would like to commend the efforts of auxiliary committees in planning and organizing the uh, the conference and uh, let me acknowledge the support of our conference organizing players who have helped us in terms of both material logistics and human resources my special thanks to all the staff of pakistan institute of development economics for their dedicated efforts in organizing the conference finally it would be unfair if I do not recognize the tremendous efforts of my core team 
as they have worked tirelessly day and night to make this conference a successful event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, praise the core team and everyone else, but there were so many other teams which worked, and we have a token of appreciation for everybody. Uh, I would request Dr. Asad Zaman to please come on stage and give away the souvenirs to team. Dr. Jazgani never praises himself, but we have to praise him and clap for him. So the first winner for the team is for Dr. Ajazgani. <laughs> Secretary PSDE. <laughs> Joint Secretaries, Mr. Adnan Akram and Ms. Sabah Anwar are not here for some reasons. And me, Joint Secretary, I will receive my shield later. So next is Azizullah, the coordinator, PSDE. Registrar Pai, Dr. Mohammad Safiruddin. Um, social media team. Fiza Halid Bart, Joint Secretary, PSDE. <laughs> thank you. And thank you very much, everyone, for your patience.